This episode of Physically Spiritual is a conversation with Andrew Kamiski. We will explore sexual restoration, healing in the church in his upcoming book, Rediscovering Our Lost Fullness, A Guide to Sexual Integration. Welcome to Physically Spiritual. I've been amazed by how much growing physically healthier has changed my spiritual life. I'm captivated by discovering the truth about my body and how it reveals the love of God. Physically Spiritual is my attempt to harmonize and share what I've discovered. I'm your host, Andrew Reinhardt. Like I said, our guest this week is Andrew Kamiski. Andrew has worked extensively with healing and a healing of the sexually and relationally broken. He's the director of Desert Stream and Living Waters Ministry, which was founded in 1980 as a a multifaceted outreach to the church. Uh, Andrew lives with his family, his wife, his children, and and, grand, and grandchildren also, uh, and is passionate about just helping people find relational wholeness and healing. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Ah, oh, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, yeah we I'm both have the same name. By your title, physically spiritual. Yeah, That's it, awesome. Yeah, and it, I didn't know it was, it was tied so much into, I don't know, something likened to being reconciled to your body. As if, yeah, yeah. Is that? I mean, I, I'm not turning this back on. No, this you, is great. But is it about? Did you have some big bodily recovery thing? Yeah. So I, in my journey, I've always been big. Um, okay. And then also a big part of my journey has been just healing from sexual brokenness. Um, so I, I'd been in seminary for a few years, coming out starting ministry had basically had gone through a couple knee surgeries. I was always really into sports okay. uh, and I gained a lot of weight. So, okay. um, but I was simultaneously passionate in teaching kind of regionally about theology of the body. Oh, that's awesome. And just, yeah. but, but felt this increasing, like um, you might say, uh, kind of chase, chafing resistance in my soul of like, mm. I'm, I'm giving this teaching about, the integration of body and soul and health and holiness. And yet, like, I'm struggling with all these things sexually, and I'm obviously very unhealthy physically, and my sleep was awful, and my stress was awful. Wow. Um, and, um, and one of the things that, that I was really interested in was kind of how to live theology of the body. I thought mm-hmm. that people um, often presented the, the teaching in a very kind of Gnostic way. Yeah. It's like, well, you need help, so go read the theology of the body or listen right. to this talk series or read this book. Right. Um, but more information doesn't necessarily help or heal. Right. Right. Especially it if you don't a have beautiful vision. Yeah. But, but how to, to live into it is a bit of a challenge, which, yeah, I, I would so intersect with that, but I, I love the, um, the, the actual idea of the practical ways in which, the body becomes disintegrated and Mm -hmm. and we become split off from it and it's no longer our friend in revealing jesus in our personhood our bodily personhood yeah and i love that and and i think as as to my journey and this book rediscovering our lost fullness which is pulled directly from TOB, Mm. uh, to me that that conveys most clearly the work that we do with people that have been sexually disintegrated. So particularly sexually, which which may or may not reveal itself in overt uh, bodily difficulties like being overweight or um, you know, unable to, to move or, you know, act in such a way as you want, but the moral disintegration mm-hmm. that can be going on while you look great or, <laughs> yeah. you know, what goes on that you can cover for, for, su- for only so long. And, uh, and so bringing some of those divides into the light of Jesus love and and a community of healing mm. um, is is basically what we're about and that's what we're seeking to rediscover is the good gift of our our yearning for connection with other persons and mm. at, at the physical level yeah. you know what do we do with that and and how 
how do we live that out in a way that confirms and clarifies another human being rather than uses them or confuses them or uh, just results in you saying, I, 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 I can't do this. I can't, yeah. I can't live this out. And so I will just choose to shut down the whole mechanism of my physical longing for connection with other people. Yeah. yeah. And we say, yeah. that's not good enough. Jesus doesn't give us that option. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, that's, that's kind of what we're about in Desert Stream. And that's what I hope this book can mm. introduce to persons and give them an invitation to say, what do I do with these distressing divides in my life? You know, yeah. how can I act with them in such a way that that brings sort of personal unification rather than greater shame and confusion. Yeah. yeah that is exactly my experience. What exactly what you're sharing there. Cause I, I basically stepped back. Like I stopped taking speaking engagements, stopped offering teaching outside of my paid job that I was in. And, um, over the next few years, just had a reckoning with my health and like mm. finding a doctor, sleep study, changing diet, by God's grace, I lost over 200 pounds, almost 200 pounds. Whoa. Um, and just, you know, I'm I still, I'm, I'm human, so I deal with stress and, it, you know, so yeah. I'm not perfect, obviously, but um, just as I got healthier, it just, like I said in the intro, kind of just revolutionized my spiritual life, my ability to pray, focus, the energy I had. Um, and what I realized was what, what, what was happening as I was getting healthier was actually part of the answer to the question of how to live TOB, mm. right? And when those points came together in my life, like that's kind of the passion that started the show wow. and the work that I do. And that's um, awesome. Because because the other thing is when you start wading into like the health and wellness space, like there's a lot of confusion. Right. Like you, you listen to two right. different very smart people and they say almost completely opposite things. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's the other part of the show is just kind of trying to navigate <clears throat> this space from a Catholic perspective. Mm. Wow. That's so cool. So good to know. And I read a little bit about it, but even knowing that I knew you a little bit from mm -hmm. the TOB work you were doing in your diocese and um, so good. So yeah, we would, we would actually consider ourselves perhaps more than anything else, a pastoral application of TOB for persons yeah. dealing with, you know, aspects of their sexuality that mm. they they want to line up uh, in accord with um, this vision that John Paul casts uh, in this marvelous tome. So, uh, yeah, we, we try to do our part in that. Yeah. And so I'm, I, I read the book, Rediscovering a Lost Fullness. I got to get an advanced copy and it's just, it's a great book. Oh, and, thanks um, so much. It's so much of it centers around your story, mm -hmm. which I think is so beautiful that one, the work you do has come out of your own experience. Mm. Um, but then you also, you share very, like you're very honest and very candid, very vulnerable, but you're also just the way that you, you honor yourself and the people in your life was also mm. very inspiring. <laughs> mm. um, so I guess I'd just love for you to share a little bit of like how your story brought you to Desert Stream Living Waters. Mm. Yeah. Yes, I'd love to. Um, yeah, uh, and thanks for that. I mean, there, there truly is an art to disclosing hmm. difficult parts of your life in a way that deflects um, a kind of reality show mentality of like, well, I've done that. And, you know, it, this kind of crass breaking boundaries just because that's so cool, you know, yeah. but, but somehow to, to, to share it with, with an element of fear and trembling, like, hmm. I, I hope I never get used to this being a, having been a good, you know, I never say this as if I'm bored with it, or it doesn't make me shudder a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. the more you share things, the, uh, the more acclimatized everyone comes. I mean, even in coming out of homosexuality, for example, one of the, 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 the tactics of gay activists from the late 60s, Stone, the Stonewall Revolution and, and from there on in, has been to share 
beautifully, you know, um, to share with nobility about one's public gay self as a way of blazing a trail, breaking a boundary, literally, that enables other people to say, I'm gay too, and it's grand, you know? So in coming out of homosexuality, I, I see that so differently. I mm. see it as, oh, there, there, there was this secret and there was um, a, a conflict early on with my reconciliation with the good of my own masculine identification mm. and uh and and there there were sort of two options that i found as a young man uh obviously the conflict was preceded becoming an adult but it was as a late teen early adult that you know the choices became clear either i just continue headlong in the gay community and seek solidarity for that self, you know? Well, I'm, mm -hmm. that's who I am. And my father was a psychology professor. So as far as I knew uh, from those resources, that was just kind of who I was, you know, that, that was reality mm -hmm. for me. And I could, I could, little r, I could assume that as a self and seek out, it wasn't hard seeking out people sexually, but also sort of emotionally and socially and, my public self being homosexual, or I could identify as a Christian. And mm. though I wasn't raised a strong Christian, my mother became an Episcopalian when we were all sort of in mid childhood, my siblings and I. Mm. And uh, so she, she sort of made a movement in the direction of Jesus, but it wasn't that compelling for us. So that didn't become a reality until my older brothers actually became very turned on Christians in the sort of California Jesus people movement hmm. in the early 70s. And um, as I began to see their lives change, I thought, oh, this isn't just about something sort of being placed upon you as in a, a, a sort of quiet liturgy, as was the case in the Episcopal Church. This is actually something that awakens from within, mm -hmm. that, that is based upon awareness and choice and, and gathering with other young people on the basis of seeking this Jesus, which mm -hmm. had never been my somewhat tepid experience, limited experience with Christianity. And so, so it simply became clear there was this powerful drive, a sexual mm -hmm. drive, and a homosexual drive in my case that was seeking to compel me and to 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 you know to drive me in a certain direction and then there was this 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 potentiality of knowing this Jesus and discovering almost a, another stream mm. a deeper stream that is is in some ways not unlike our sexuality, it's deeper and it's it's more substantial, I think, but but you don't know that right off, you know? Yeah. You're, 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 you see trees walking, you don't see <laughs> Jesus and his community very clearly at first, as was the case for me. But I'm so grateful for even being in that wrestle, being in that fight, yeah. even having the grace to say, I I have a decision to make about my destiny and about my identity um and and that was kind of the that was kind of the battle of my uh, late uh, pre pre adult life and, and early young adult life mm. was uh who would define me what would drive me and in in ultimately making a decision to follow jesus and to to begin a long pathway of recovery and discipleship and integration, mm. uh, uh, you know, that that's sort of the basis for uh, my and, and my wife, the woman who became my wife, uh, beginning to, to provide some kind of a watering hole for other persons who were in that same juncture and well who 
yes, I, I understand this decision, but who will help me? You know, yeah. who will be the community for me to to help me decide where I'm going to land? And hmm. I just like the fact that we have choice. I like the fact that the church can mobilize herself uh, to be a restorative community. Yeah. Um, I love the fact that we actually can be reconciled to the good of man for woman and woman for man, regardless of our starting points. And um, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's such broad strokes, yeah. <laughs> but that's kind of, kind of how good. I... it went in the beginning. Yeah, well, well, I think that beginning is important because I, I know I, I've experienced this, and I think others do too. Is you you see someone who's giving a message, and you know you at this point in your life with with your family, with the ministry you do, with the the maturity, the healing the Lord's worked in you, mm -hmm. um, and, and people f oftentimes you know wonder like why am I not there yet right mm -hmm. they're, they're still in the storm mm -hmm. they, they still don't see clearly so mm -hmm. um, I just worry, would you share a little more about like what what were those early stages actually like for you like yeah. like just the yeah. emotional side of it mm -hmm. the, what did the journey look like like how did you find you know just just the the, the very bare beginnings of of healing, of peace, of, mm -hmm. of restoration and yeah. uh, to give people a little bit of encouragement who yes, you know, might have heard this and the idea of, of you know, it's almost like you had a second coming out, you know, to use that, that mm -hmm. term, but it's like you came out as a child of God right? Um, right. Uh, who yeah. happened to have homosexual attractions, you know? Yes, yes, yes. And I think that, that, that says a lot about what was going on in those first four or five years. Mm. And that was about the axis shifting from mm. the gay self to, to a son of the father, to one deeply mm. loved by Jesus, yeah. uh, to one who was primarily identifying with other Christians who were gracefully open about their own struggles to being chaste. So yeah. I wasn't the profoundly unchaste one. Hmm. I was uh, as much uh, a saint and a beggar as hmm. they were seeking after the mercy of God, perhaps for their more normal sins. But in Southern California, in a beach community, it, the, 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 the onus of idolatry was on normal opposite sex relations. Um, I didn't have the corner on idolatry. The men and women dating who could not keep their hands off each on each other, off each other, the lust factor. I didn't have the corner on lust. And that was actually so freeing rather than, yeah. oh, I'm the porn hound. I'm the one who brought down the civilizations of the world, you know. Um, I'm the one who caused Sodom to be destroyed. Um, I thought, oh, no, all the the you know, the secrets and lies around normal Christian dating is, mm. is far more nefarious than what I'm doing. Uh, you know, as far as the, the, the norm, the normalcy of the idolatry. Mm -hmm. And so finding walking partners with whom I could confess my sins, uh, and, and for whom the response was not, Oh, Andy, you're, you're God's little gay man. Uh, but, oh, oh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I need to bring this yeah. out in the open and let's pray for each other. Would you help me be clear today? So uh, I, the 12-step tw uh, recovery was not my primary way out. But in a way, there's an essence to that, which was a part of my way out mm -hmm. that was operative in the believing community I found at UCLA. I was a student there. Um, and, and I had to sort of help create that. I had to out myself and be the first one to say, hey, can we find a way to live in humility together and yeah. to not kid ourselves that we're not seeking, we're not all seeking to align our sexuality in a way that is, is somewhat chaste. So I think that was key. Um, and, and that was a big part of it. The other thing was discovering helpful insights. I was in a very empowered community mm -hmm that believed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, I would say yes and amen to 
the need for that. I, I believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm. I believe that we do best when we are operating in in that, in words of wisdom and in, in healing and confirming prophetic words and discernment. Mm. And when when we have wise older brothers and sisters who are helping cultivate those gifts in us, that was operative in the community I was mm. in. So this hastened some of the healing work because there was a level of spiritual sensitivity and insight yeah. that was bringing about deeper reconciliation in me. But it wasn't until I read a woman named Leanne Payne who had written wonderful books like The Broken Image, The Healing Presence, Restoring the Christian Soul, and who was appropriating the healing movement of the Holy Spirit to some of the deep divides of the soul and particularly sexual divides. She mm -hmm. was in the Episcopal Church and that was being torn apart in that time period. This was now uh, the late 70s, early 80s, uh, when, when the Protestant denominations were beginning to disintegrate due to the gay question. Can gay people be ordained? Mm -hmm. Can we do gay unions in the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Lutherans and the, the Episcopalians leading the parade there? And yeah. Leanne was in that and was deeply disturbed. And her take was, we simply don't understand what's going on with homosexuality, mm -hmm. meaning we don't understand uh, the psychological disintegration and that results in a spiritual disintegration, uh, thus, denominations being shattered and split and wasting way too much time on the homosexual question, something that, that should not impact most people becoming the dividing line of all the major U.S. historic denominations. And so she wrote about that so beautifully and piercingly, and it pierced my heart and uh, gave myself and at this time my, my fiancé so much hope and clarity in my own healing journey and in aspects of my wife's. Uh, she was a sexual abuse. Uh, she was sexually abused as a child and, and, and she needed a lot of healing in her life. Mm. We were both dealing with areas of disintegration. And so we learned how to come together in our relationship to be appropriately honest and to seek help that we needed both of fellow lay persons, but also clinically, we got good counseling. Mm. Uh, we had pastors who were sensitive to these issues. And uh, so all of this combined to, to uh, resulting in, in our uh, seeing fit to, to begin to gather with people and mm. just to be of help to them. Yeah, yeah. I love what you said at the beginning. The way I would say it is, we're all called to the same chastity. Like I think that like I used to have the opportunity to teach a lot of RCIA classes. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I basically say, say this question, like we're everyone in the church is called to the same chastity. Yeah. And it's simply that that if you're married, you have only have sex with that one person. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So so the, the choice between celibacy and marriage is simply the choice between one person. Because mm -hmm. um, people people present it as if like <clears throat> Once you become celibate, you're giving up this whole like universe of sexual experience, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. as if like every person out there is a potential mm -hmm. partner or something mm -hmm. like that. So, right. so it's as right. if um, celibate. And, and so there's a confusion between what celibacy is and chastity is, as if the mm -hmm. celibates are the only chaste people, mm -hmm. right? But as 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 Catholics, we're all called to the same chastity, right? And then then from that context. It's well, everyone based on their own history, whatever it is, whether it be generational or, or from your early childhood or trauma or experience or your own traumatizing yourself through sin, like we, we all experience a certain brokenness, right? right? And that's obviously different for everyone. Right. right? So, so then it creates a common ground on right. which we can heal together. Right. And what I heard in your story is you both were given up like natural tools, mm -hmm. you know, like good conversation and honesty and relationships. And, mm. uh, but then you also had a whole set of supernatural tools right. of, of prayer ministry and, um, and grace and, and your own right. personal prayer and the community of the church. Right. Um, right. And, and, the, and warfare, how, the warfare that surrounds unspoken divides. Yeah. So much warfare. Um, the accuser sort of having the last word when we won't speak a word. 
Yeah. And, uh, uh, and yeah, creating safe and dynamic spaces in the church is, is our passion. There's so mm. many good helps, you know, today with books and, you know, so many sort of uh, virtual things, but there's, there's, uh, as well as clinical resources. And I'm, I'm an old fashioned guy. I still believe that you shouldn't get most of your healing on Zoom. <laughs> uh, I think it needs to be incarnational. And, uh, you know, we become broken relationally and we, we, we heal yeah. together. And, and that doesn't occur so well through a screen. We lose vital dimensions uh, in, in, our, in the saving love that we need when we cannot meet regularly face to face. And uh, for the look and the touch and the presence, mm -hmm. um, for the, trans the everyday sacraments that, that yeah. set us free, that keep us free. And, and I believe that needs to be where we worship, you know, so living mm -hmm. waters groups are, are, we, we train lay people working with the elderships and the priests and the diocesan leaders to actually do living waters mm -hmm. in their diocese. Um, but it's where they worship as opposed to, oh, go far, far away. You know, no one should ever hear about this, mm -hmm. you know? So it's kind of like, yes, be perfectly honest, but please don't talk about it. You know, you need to cross three state lines before you can actually open up about this. I'm like, well, I'm sorry, I'm turning on the TV with two women or two men seducing each other or a man becoming a woman before my eyes and all manner of lighter forms of adultery. And yet I'm not supposed to be able to find a safe space where I ingest God and and say his saving love is what sets me free it's yeah. this big split so and and there's ways of doing that that's wise and helpful and of course we've all experienced things that have not been um and we have to learn from that but we have to be all the more committed to to integrating our recovery where we worship mm -hmm. that's our commitment and uh I think I think we've lagged a little behind in that as no, a I church, but it's not too late. Yeah, one of my uh, one of the points I harp on a lot is the church ought to offer more than a referral. Yeah, <laughs> you know, because so That's often it's referral so well. to a counselor, to yeah. a treatment center, to maybe a twelve step group, or yeah. you know, all 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 I think good tools that are yeah will be helpful for many people. Mm -hmm. But I think well, as a church. I love them all, but we have yeah. to offer mm -hmm. compelling answers to life's biggest and hardest questions. Mm -hmm. Like it all needs to happen in the body of Christ. Amen. Um, so, yeah, so you have this, this first group you start with you and your fiance, yeah. um, kind of early in your journey, but already having yeah. experienced some healing by God's yeah. grace. Yeah. Um, and then this grows into now the ministry that you lead, Desert Streams, and right. you have these Living Waters groups. So exactly. now you're, you're training folks to lead these groups now in churches, yes, all Christian churches, Catholic, non-Catholic. Yes. Um, and, and I love this, like you said, that, that any sexual issue is a relational issue. So we also need a relational solution. Yeah. Right. So I, I think so often we think, uh, we don't want a relational solution. I think probably because of shame, mm -hmm. like you mentioned shame there. No. Um, but I'm just going to like read the book and try harder. <laughs> Yeah, that that's so yeah. often what people do. It's like we just we we find ways to like push more willpower onto the problem. Yeah, often focusing the willpower on the symptom and yeah. not the underlying illness. Yeah. So what oftentimes it looks like I think in people's lives is 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 they accumulate a pressure of will by gathering knowledge and then applying guilt, <laughs> mm. and then using external uses of pressure too, like mm. maybe a filtering software or some kind of a, a wagering system or something like that. Mm -hmm. But what is it? It's like an, it's like a willpower arms race mm. to try to, to try to stop the behavior. Mm. Right. And, and I love what you're proposing because in this relational solution, mm. you're really starting to just in, in the very way of healing itself mm. in the way of overcoming itself, 
it, it, it by definition includes addressing the root, mm -hmm. which is relationship. Right. Right. Um, right. And I would, I would dare say that I, I hold those two things in intention, hmm. the growing trust and connection, meaningful communion. For example, in my case, that the disintegration from my own masculine adequacy did fuel, it's not the only reason, but it certainly did empower this kind of pagan romancing, eroticizing mm -hmm. of other men. I mean, yeah. I was split off from my own adequacy. I sort of project that onto these supercharged males in pictures, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to make that connection. It's like, why am I drawn to that? You know, yeah. how weird, but in a way, how clear that mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm working something out there. Um, so, I can then say, okay, I need to be reconciled to the good of my own masculinity. I need to, I need to acclimatize to that appropriately with my brothers. I, I have to start making mm. potential lovers friends and learning good platonic skills. Like, mm. yeah, I need that. That's a real need. It's a, it's, that's not, that's not an immoral problem. It's a real need that I have just to live uh, effectively and naturally in this body and so on. But if I don't also realize, but I've been looking at gay porn for years mm -hmm. and my circuitry is now all, I'm all wired up according yeah. to that. If I don't take that symptom seriously, even while I'm seeking to integrate in my normal natural self, and I would say that I'm a normal guy. I'm not a mm. gay dude. There's no gay dudes. There's mm. no trans women. You know, that's a myth. It's a fake anthropology and it empowers our worst desires. Mm. So let's just get that straight. There's men, there's women. Uh, we're all called to be reconciled to the good of our manness, our womanness, to one nature, two selves, right? Man and woman. Mm. But I would say in recovery, we have to deal with the symptom and say, mm -hmm. I'm going to be fiercely honest about that till I'm done. And, and that doesn't always make sense. You know, it's always like, well, if I deal with the root, it'll just fall away. That has not been my experience. Yeah. It has been my experience that I deal with both simultaneously. And I hold that in a wonderful tension yeah. um, because sound as I am today, and I'm pretty sound. I have a great wife, been married 42 years, faithful man, love my kids, love my wife, body, soul, and spirit. Um, but I could fall off the wagon. I could, I can get off this interview and look up some crappy thing and go, that's, that's alluring to me. Yeah. And so I, you know, it's like, uh, I'll, I'll do the daily, I'll do the come into the light and die daily thing as long as I need. <laughs> yeah. And it's been a little longer than I would like. Um, but it, that actually does not challenge the soundness of my foundation as a man. Yeah. It's ju it just means that I live in the, the reality of my history and in an increasingly idolatrous world that is mm. certainly not getting better for me. Yeah. I so... Yeah. So anyway, just that's whatever. It is. So much of, um, <laughs> yeah. of what you're saying strikes me as like, how do we confront lies? Yeah. Right. Though, and this happens in relationships and the groups, uh, in that honest disclosure. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it it happens. I think physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I think in mm -hmm. so many ways, like trauma. Yeah. What what trauma is is it's it's a lie the body believes. Mm. Right. Because what happens in trauma is now I react in the present from that echo of whatever the difficult thing in the past was. Yes. Right. So, so my, my physiological reaction isn't in accord with, with the reality of the situation I'm in. Right. Like that's one of right. the symptoms. Right. Um, in, in the same way, emotionally, you know, we, we have this kind of whole complex of, of feelings and reactions and, and so many of them are based on a lie mm. on, on really an identity lie. Yeah. Which, which comes from a spiritual place. So, so in the book, I think you so masterfully um, 
you so magically talk about this idea of identity mm. and, and finding truth in identity. Mm. Um, you know, on, on page 85, he said, perhaps our creator and redeemer sees instead persons wounded by abuse and neglect who have come to mistaken emotional needs for erotic ones. And that line just like hit me on the back of that, like mm. Mm. mistaken emotional needs for erotic ones. Um, and the way that we really come to like self-objectify to use our sexuality as a tool mm. to deal with our wounds and bad feelings and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but this all comes from like this idea of identity, mm -hmm. um, whether it be like an, I see on one hand, like the possibility of taking on like an LGBTQ kind of identity, mm -hmm. like identifying with your sin. But I, I see like also maybe a danger on the opposite side of identifying with your, with your recovery, <laughs> mm, right? Yeah. And I think this is, can come up in some like 12 step concepts of like, well, I'm yes. the addict, I'm, yes. I'm the alcoholic, I'm the sex right. addict, Keep whatever it is. Keep reminding yourself. Yeah. yeah, when you forget that you're done. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and it, you know, it doesn't take, like I can, I can easily hold as one, this is my, this is my true self. This is my mm. authentic self. JP says that, you know, his language, we won't even top it. So we may as well just yeah. <laughs> quote it, you know, as yeah. far as that deep personalism and sort of the deeper we go in Jesus, the truer we become, the truer the real Andrew Comiskey becomes or, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, I love that. And, and, and that has to be foundational. And then that should free us. That should give us great confidence to to shout our sin from the rooftops or our, our longing for sin because of a bad day or because of some, you know, uh, hit and run emotional driver, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, ah, you know, <laughs> what happened? What happened to the glorious Andrew? Like, oh, well, don't, you know, don't be shocked. You don't be. Why are you shocking yourself? Why are you? Why are you so surprised that you're? you're still capable of X, Y, or Z, it doesn't actually change my foundations. My foundations give me the freedom mm. to own the conflict and to work it out with integrity so mm. that it doesn't have to become a lost weekend or you yeah. know, another six months AWOL or a new parish or, oh, you're moving again? You know, <laughs> like, nah, yeah. nah I'm, I'm, I, ain't, I, ain't, I ain't got anywhere to go. <laughs> I want reality. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the time I want it, but at least I have the bearing, you know, the bearing to to stay put and deal with it. Yeah. And people, I think, mistaken, like you might say long sobriety for safety. Um, yeah. You know, the idea yeah. that uh, just because I haven't done something in a while means that that now I'm I'm somehow safer. I think the Lord often in my life when I reflect mm -hmm. on, yeah. you know, Lord, like how do I still struggle with this stuff? I yeah. think. I think my worst case scenario would be me thinking that I don't need God. Wow. You know, my worst case scenario yeah. is me thinking that I don't need God. So, yeah. so, so as long as I still have roots of pride and vanity in my heart, yeah. I think the Lord leaves me frail yeah. to some extent, yeah. leaves me relying on him yeah. because my worst case scenario isn't, you know, falling back into pornography or, or whatever it is. My yeah. worst case scenario is actually forgetting my need for God, my relationship with the Lord. Um, so that, that, that frailty that persists, even in the face of long virtue, I think is, is, is a common experience and it, that, that I think some people deny, like, like some people think that true strength is like the idea that like, it's not even a problem anymore. Like there's yeah. no longer any temptations. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, I often, I get worried when people say that, like, I'm not even tempted anymore. And I yeah. wonder like, what's going on there? Right. right. Cause, cause if the roots aren't healed, um, I think, I think oftentimes repression can masquerade as virtue. Yeah. Right. Yes. Jesus says you will know them by their fruits. Yes. So, so we know we're chaste when our life is bearing the fruits of chastity. Yes. Not yes. when we're no longer performing certain behaviors. Yes. So this means the Lord can begin to use us while we're still early in the journey. Yeah. 
But on the other hand, we could be having like, quote unquote, not acted out for 50 years, right? but still not really be chased. Yes. Uh, Cause I think sometimes you might have like a, like a transference of like, well, now you're just acting out with something else. And sometimes you've just obliterated your whole emotional self mm. <laughs> in a kind of a repression. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, the quote that struck me from the book for this, you said, and I'm just going to, this is going to be the last quote. I know hearing your own book read to you is probably like it's not the most pleasant experience. But, to my ears. Oh, good. I'm, so on page 170, you say, chastity rescues sex from being just a gymnastics exercise, but it also, also rescues us from total abstinence. Hmm. Chastity liberates sex to life and to order the sexes to tend to that life. Through chastity, we integrate our powers of life and love so we can fulfill our human destiny to be at once fruitful and responsible. Um, that first, that first line, I, I literally started laughing. Chastity rescue sex from being just a gymnastics exercise. Uh, because that, on some level, I think people make it just like a technique. You know, yeah. like, you want to have better sex, well, read this technique right. book. But, right. but just the idea that what, what we're seeking is a deeper chastity, a deeper communion a deeper relationship, a deeper intimacy that we happen to express sometimes with our bodies. But then also, then just the idea that we're all called to the same chastity. Mm -hmm. So that chastity is also lived out for people whom aren't married to anyone. Yeah. So that same integration, that same relational connection, mm -hmm. it's, it's fruitful in both cases, but in a different context. Yes. Um, and I think that's such an important message for the church because frankly, I think... I think a lot of, we have, and I love priests. My whole, part of my whole ministry is ministry to priests, but I think a lot of priests on one hand are still struggling in chastity mm -hmm. and they are very lonely in that struggle, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very feel very condemned in it. The yeah. enemy is just, has so much free reign in their hearts to, to torture them yeah. in their struggles. And they feel like there's so few places they can go mm -hmm. to find this kind of real connection. Yeah. On the other hand, I feel like a lot of clergy have resolved that through repression, <clears throat> right? So it was just a no holds barred. I need to figure out how not to act out before I'm ordained. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but then what we see is you'll know them by their fruits. Like, mm -hmm. even though they, they aren't looking at porn or masturbating, they also don't experience this fruit in their ministry in life. Right. Right. And, and the narrow way is this place, um, that like we've already talked about is really, I think, guided by this kind of relational path yeah. yes. of, of disclosure, of sharing, of, of experiencing Friendship. God through other people. Yeah. yeah. And, and was I've rambled a bit, but. <laughs> no, I, pre yeah. I appreciate that. I think uh, in same gender friendship, learning how to be proactive, purposeful, mm focused and affectionate, but side by side, you know, I'm, I'm side by side you and I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to walk with you. I want to take ground together mm. in, in living chastely. Yeah. I want, I want you to be more chaste as a result of this friendship, not mm. sort of confused or, well, what's going on or that kind of looking and longing on the sly, you know, it's like, come mm -hmm. on, like, let's snap out of it. Let's get yeah. on with it. I mean, that's for SSA people, you know. Yeah. Um, but but for guys that are a little disengaged and, you know, are in the, just that lonely place, you know, tormented by opposite gender stuff, whatever. Like friendship. I, I think friendship matters. And then also learning how to be friends with the opposite gender. You know, mm. I love my wife. She's primary to me, but my wife doesn't meet all my needs. Right. Yeah. And I've grown so much as a married person with dynamic women in my life. Mm. And it's not emotional adultery. And uh, it's not like, you know, you know, you know, when something is off, yeah. you know, when people are too attuned to each other in a way that only lovers share, even mm -hmm. if there's no genital stuff going on. So we have to discern that and say, yeah. oh, come on, you're actually landing in a sacred place with each other that is, is potentially dangerous on certain mm -hmm. levels, whether you're single or married, but that we 
you know, I think John Paul, that's the brilliance of TOB. It's like, okay, yeah, adultery of heart. We all got it. Matthew 5. Got it. You know, guilty. But can we do better? You know, mm -hmm. and 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 he I love how he flips around Matthew 5, 27 and 28 and says, if Jesus is 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 exposing these adulteries, then doesn't he have power in us to help us fulfill the law of faithfulness, you know, yeah. to, to become more chaste than we were adulterous. Hmm. And that's that's his boast, which says something about his empowerment in the Holy Spirit, yeah. that he believes something about Jesus in us that isn't just a future hope, but it's a now hope hmm. that I can take big ground in fidelity uh, uh, as far as those nuances of adultery uh, yep. that linger still in our hearts. So I, I believe that and I, I, I don't think it's an easy journey. It's exhilarating and it does set us free. Our choosing to do it sets us free. Yep. And uh, so. I, re I relate a lot to like those subtle temptations that you've talked about, mm -hmm. even though, even though like the same sex attraction isn't as profound a part of my story. Um, it's um, like, I think of back to like friendships that I had before my wife and I were married or when I was, I was in seminary for four years. So while I was mm -hmm. uh, discerning mm -hmm. celibacy of like, you know, why am I calling this person or why, why did I ask that person if they wanted a ride to this event we were both going to? Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there, there's ways that I would position myself with people because of my sexual attractions in situations where there would never be a romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. right? So these just subtle things. And then, like you, like you said earlier, uh, now being married, like am I still seeing people as potential partners? Mm. I mean, that, that, that choice to maybe look and objectify. Yeah. Um, you know, and like just, you know, to share some of the, the woundedness in my own heart, like, like there's been moments where I've known this has been true of me because the enemy continues to push, right? That's, that's the thing. The enemy will be subtle at first, but then once he gets ground, he'll start pushing in mm -hmm. for more ground. Mm -hmm. So thoughts like, well, if my wife were to die, who would I ask out? Hmm. Like, who's the next person I would be with? Wow. Right, right. Yeah. So, so that thought comes into my mind. And then, then you, then, then that's a gut check for me. Okay, Lord, okay. like, where am I at right now? Yeah. You know, like, like what, what lust has preceded this? How have I been looking at people? What are the choices mm -hmm. I've been making? Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and, and in so many ways, it's, it's these subtle moves yeah. in the heart and mind, that spiritual warfare. Yeah, exactly. And, I, and to me, um, that's where I love the cross. I, I, I have mm -hmm. a special devotion to Christ crucified, which to me is never a dead work. It's yeah. such a dynamic work and it's so magnetic hmm. in its power. It'll, he, it, both alone have power to draw that out of me and to say, no, uh, in a sense, let me have all of that, those inklings, but also let, let me go deeper in that mm. in that place where you're still a little vulnerable to that yeah. ideation or i mean like you say it's subtle you know i've never violated uh, my wife through overt action but that there haven't been many inklings of course yeah. uh, but they remain inklings and 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 i can let go of that quickly like a like a rag mm. uh in light of this witness of the cross and and it's it's magnetism and i feel whenever i do that the cross goes deeper in me yeah. that there's something truer in me that that takes its advantage and it it conquers um demonic schemes yeah yeah amen <laughs> the cross conquers demonic schemes in us yeah with and I would say specifically with truth. Yes. Our Lord says the truth will set you free. Yes. Uh, one more quote. On page 125, you, the Holy Spirit told you, don't ask me to set you free. 
if you are not honest about your sin. In other words, you enslave yourself to sin unless you reveal yourself. Yeah. For me, that was like, that was like kind of the nutshell of the whole book. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that's like, right. that's so the don't kernel. Don't the book, just write that down. That's the kernel. So that the rest. No, but no, no, no. but just that idea because <laughs> thank you that's honestly great. I'm I'm like pers- and this is probably from my own woundedness my own brokenness because a lot of my own childhood stuff led me to become very self sufficient mm-hmm. and very capable mm-hmm. which makes me seem very great on the surface yeah. right because I can get everything done and I'm very helpful to other people and but but on the other hand like there's there's a part of me that's very ill equipped to overcome things that I'm just not strong enough to overcome right, right? or because, to have need just to have need. Mm-hmm. Like, could, could I rely on you here? Yeah. You know, would you help me? <laughs> Will you do something good for me if I'm lame? You know, if I yeah. falter, will you be my friend? You know, it's like having need. I, I, that to me, that's so big. Like, where can I, where can I have need? I, I'm, hmm. I don't know. I just work really hard to ascertain and meet others needs. That's that's the sweet spot. Yeah, exactly. So the harder thing, I think, is often, not always, but often to say, who can I go to with this, you know? Who can I open to? And that's a great gift when you find that. Yeah, yeah, and I'm in it. It's like I've, I found it, but I also need more of it. You know, I that, need more of it, too. That relational connection that... Yeah discovering how to find the truth in relationship of being honest yeah. and receiving honesty back. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just, it's, it's such, it's so much exactly what's needed in any sexual brokenness. Yeah. On the other hand, it's what we're almost offering the least yeah. as a church in these contexts. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Andrew, you're a good interviewer and a deep man and I'm privileged to know you. Well, thank you. Yeah, me, me with you too. Let's let's leave the people with some practicals. Okay. Uh, so, link in the show notes. The okay. book is is coming out really soon by Sophia Institute Press. Rediscovering our lost fullness: A guide yeah, to November sexual integration. November twenty second. Yeah. So three weeks. Yep, three weeks from when we're recording. This will come out next Tuesday. Uh, the the actual episode when it will go live. Oh, great. Uh, so it'll be about just under two weeks then, or over two weeks then. Great. But with that, the book is basically framed. Andrew tells his story. Um, with it, he's framing it with both then bringing in uh, theology of the body, but then also bringing in the four cardinal virtues, all in this kind of relational context that we've been talking about. Um, so so I, it's, it's in a sense, you could say it like a personal encounter with Andrew, <laughs> but it's also mm-hmm. digging richly into the church's tradition. Um, yeah. yeah, so I just, I can't, I can't recommend the book enough. Also, um, if you head to, so the ministry Desert Stream Living Waters, he has these living waters groups all over the country, all over the, in other parts of the world too. Right. Um, and that, that would be desertstream.org. Would desertstream.org. Be. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so we'll have the link in the show notes to this, the site and then also where you can find a group. And then with that too, the Theology of the Body Institute is partnering with Desert Stream um, this upcoming end of January into February for a course called Sexual Integration and Redemption, which is the the kind of formation and training that leaders of Living Waters groups receive, but also then kind of a little bit more in the context of TOB. Exactly. Uh, yep. So that's the that great opportunity coming yep. up. It's a good merging. Yeah, very good. And if you, the Living Waters material, the guidebook, mm. which is kind of our essence, if you will, what we mm-hmm. walk people through, counselors and pastors can walk through it with with people that they're serving is now available. So you can get the Living Waters Guidebook on our website, desertstream.org. So Mm. that would be a great complement with this new book, Rediscovering Our Lost Fullness. Uh, So, yeah. All right, excellent. Yeah. So I I gotta head it off at the pass here. Yes. Would you recommend somebody get that book and read it on their own? Or would you recommend that they only do it in like a relational context? Uh, Living Waters, the guidebook, because it's pretty, it's deep and yeah. it's it's very engaging. I would say, yes, do it. Do it with a brother or sister. I, I yeah. don't think you need a psychiatrist for it. 
or an ordained priest necessarily, though that would be great. <laughs> Maybe not the psychiatrist, way too expensive. But, <laughs> but with friends, with friends, I think yeah. that, I, that to draw you into a mutual disclosure, however mm. different your struggles are, I think would be optimal. Yeah, yeah, because my first thought would be, okay, I'm going to get the book and that'll fix me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so I right. have to bring that up. Right, but I think I think rediscovering our lost fullness, you could that definitely take that yourself and let that kind of wet your appetite. I would say mm -hmm. um, you can do it with others, but I, I I think that would be a good read alone as well. Excellent. Well, Andrew, thank you so much. This has been like a joy, a pleasure. Uh, an honor. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Yeah, and, and with that, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for the show. Um, head over to physicallyspiritual.com if you want to support the show. You can find all the episodes on any podcast player, YouTube, or Facebook. God bless everyone. Thank you so much for being a part of Physically Spiritual. Every moment of the show you've watched, know that I'm grateful that you've given your time to this. I'm so passionate about the message that I'm trying to share, and I'm excited about the future of the show. So thank you for every like, every view, every watch, every follow, every comment, every rating you give in the show. And a special thank you to all you that are already members of the Awakened Nation. So thanks again for supporting the show.